Hello everyone and welcome to this A-Level Psychology video on sexual selection. So before we get started, just very quickly, what is it that you need to know, or more importantly, what is it that you're going to be able to do by the time this video is finished? So you need to be able to outline what is meant by an evolutionary approach to behavior. So you need to be familiar with words such as natural selection and also sexual selection as well, which is obviously the focus of this video. You're also going to come across certain terms like anisogamy, intersexual selection, intrasexual selection and mate choice. These are also terms that you're going to have to be able to define and explain as well. Using all of those terms, you're going to be able to explain human mate preferences and then to finish it all off you're going to be able to evaluate sexual selection um, and also evolutionary explanations for partner preference. Okay so just to kick it off then, just to get it out of the way, what do we mean by evolutionary explanations of behavior? So these explanations explain human behavior in terms of adaptiveness and reproductive success. So the approaches argue that if a behavioral feature, for example, aggression, has been genetically inherited by one generation from another, then it must have some kind of specific value for that species. So it might either help humans to adapt better to the environment and survive, that's called natural selection, or it might help to attract a mate and help to have healthy offspring, which is called sexual selection. So we're going to move on to sexual selection now. Um, so sexual selection as a theory explains the evolution of characteristics that provide a reproductive advantage as opposed to a survival advantage. So with natural selection, it's all about gaining attributes or passing on characteristics that help you to survive. Sexual selection, on the other hand, is all about having attributes that help you to reproduce. If you don't have those characteristics, your survival isn't on the line. However, your ability to pass on those characteristics to your descendants is on the line. Okay, so the idea is that evolution favors the development of some features that are deemed to be attractive to the opposite sex. And those features make it more likely that the possessor will attract a mate and be able to reproduce. That means that these attributes or behaviors increase your reproductive success and those attributes are then passed on um, to succeeding generations and may become exaggerated as the years go on. So it is the same as natural selection other than you're not passing on attributes that help you to survive, you are passing on attributes that help you to reproduce. As an example, using humans, um, if height is deemed to be attractive in males, then over generations we will see an increase in particularly tall males because the tall males will get the opportunity to reproduce because they're going to be deemed as more attractive. If the tall males are reproducing, then they are passing on the genes that allow them to be tall and therefore succeeding generations are also going to be tall. Well, that's sexual selection. Now the question is, what influences human reproductive behavior? Now there are several things that do influence it, and we're going to go through them now. The main one is something called anisogamy. Now anisogamy refers to differences between male and female sex cells. So you've got your male sex cells, your sperm, and you've got your female sex cells, your egg or your ova. Um, and there's big differences between the two which actually have an effect on how males and females go about finding a partner to reproduce with. 
Okay, so if we just break it down in terms of sperm versus egg, um, these are the things that we think about. So you've got the egg, which is quite large in comparison to the sperm, which is very, very small. You've also got different differing quantities as well. So sperm is produced in very, very large quantities um, and is very, very quickly replenished as well. Also, your sperm is continuously created from puberty all the way through to old age. In contrast to that, female sex cells take a lot of energy to produce. They're only created in limited numbers during a specific time interval, and their production only lasts for a certain number of fertile years. So actually as well, if you think about it, the egg is quite rare when compared to the sperm, which is very, very common. Okay, so all of those differences have actually given rise to different mating strategies that are adopted by males and females. And those are called inter and intra sexual selection. So let's go into those and see what they actually are. So first off, we are going to start with intersexual selection. Now intersexual selection is also known as mate choice or female choice. And this type of strategy is preferred by females. Now, if we go back to this idea of female sex cells being uh, much rarer and much more. And if we combine that with the fact that the female members of the species will have to carry the offspring to term and then also care for it after it's born um, until it can look after itself. You could argue that female members of the species have actually got a much greater investment um, in terms of time, energy and resources required to produce and care for their offspring. So because they have this greater investment, it pays to be picky. Okay, So it pays to be choosy. You wouldn't just want to um, reproduce with anybody because of the amount of investment that it involves. So the optimum strategy for the female members of the species is to select a genetically fit partner who is able and willing to provide resources. Don't just pick anybody, pick the perfect partner. Wait for Mr. Right, metaphorically speaking. Now what that means is, because the female members of the species are going to sit back and they're going to be choosy and they're going to pick the, the perfect person or the perfect mate, that means the males have to compete with each other for the opportunity to prove themselves to the females. They have to compete for the opportunity to reproduce. And it's the female's desire for a fit male that determines what the males are competing in and then what is then passed on to the offspring. So if height, for example, is something that is deemed as attractive and the males are competing in terms of height, then the tallest male will get the opportunity to reproduce and the height is what would get passed on or one of the things that would get passed on to the offspring. As you can see in the picture here, um, the birds on the top picture, the one on the left is the male bird and he's puffing out his red chest to show his bright colours to try and impress the female. As with the birds below, the two brightly coloured ones are the males and they are competing for the female. Now, the male strategy is called mate competition or intra-sexual selection. The male strategy for reproducing is more of a quantity over quality strategy. Mate competition refers to the evolutionary developed features that allow a male to compete with other males for a female mate. So the winner of the competition is allowed to reproduce and is allowed to pass on to his offspring the genes that contributed to his success. 
Um, as we said before, the females decide what is attractive. The females decide the characteristic that they want, and it is that characteristic that the males are um, competing in. And when I say choose, this isn't something that um, is different from female to female of the species. It's something general. Now, this whole competition strategy of the males um, has given rise to something that's known as physical dimorphism. And physical dimorphism in humans is the obvious differences between males and females. So the obvious physical differences such as taller males, broader shoulders, bigger upper body strength. These, these are things that males have developed because size matters when you are competing. Larger males have more chance of winning and therefore males have evolved to be bigger in terms of those things so that they can win competitions. Women don't compete, which means that there's no drive towards physically larger females because there was never any reason for females to uh, become any larger in terms of uh, in terms of winning competitions etc or beating off other females now of course intrasexual selection can also have controversial behavioral and psychological consequences as well because if males males are always competing with other males then it gives rise to things like aggression and protective behaviors some of which can be quite controversial particularly in this day and age because you get um males who feel like they have to protect their partners or so they feel like they have to fight with other males or they get quite um clingy and quite overbearing and that's something that is quite controversial uh, sometimes it doesn't always happen luckily it's fairly rare but it is there so just be aware of that as well um so in terms of anisogamy the optimal strategy for men or for males of the species is to mate with and impregnate as many females as possible because they have the capability to do so with minimal effort and minimal postnatal responsibilities. In the animal kingdom, males reproduce and move on. It's then the females who usually care for the offspring. Right, I'll just give you a couple of examples of intrasexual selection. So you've got the stag that competes with the other stag in terms of antlers. The stronger stag with the biggest antlers wins. So you've got the colourful birds that puff out their chest. We've got another example of that here as well. You've got the male, which is the black and turquoise, and the female, which by comparison looks relatively boring in terms of colour. You've then also got the, the male with the big plume as well, nice and big, nice and colourful, also trying to impress the female. And then you've also got humans, obviously, uh, men who like to show off their assets shall we say uh, and try to impress females all the time in terms of what they have now interestingly the consequences of anisogamy and the consequences of inter and intrasexual selection means that males and females actually have specific press preferences in terms of what they want in a partner so research has shown that females they look for genetically fit partners with resources. Okay, resources means intelligence, creativity, status, ambition, financial prospects. They're looking for a male that can provide resources and protection to them and their offspring. Whereas males, on the other hand, they look for fertility, signs of fertility. They look for youth, chastity, modesty. They look for those kinds of characteristics that suggest that the female in question is somebody that could potentially be a reproductive partner. Now, I hasten to add at this point, this is evolutionary theory. Okay, This is not me saying that all men just want to sleep around with young, fertile women um, and don't have anything else on their minds, nor am I saying that all females are just 
sitting back and uh, trying to find the man who can provide them with the most resources all of the time. and they, ha- they don't care about anything else either. All the research is suggesting is that universally across many species, including humans, males and females have developed different strategies for ensuring reproductive success and there are certain traits that both males and females find attractive in the opposite sex and these are traits that make us consider certain people to be potential reproductive partners over others and also just on a side note before we do the evaluation As much as there's plenty of research to back all of this up, this is something that you can actually go and observe in real life. If you go out uh, to a social gathering, uh, to a pub, to a club, anywhere where you might find men and women interacting with each other, particularly if the men and women are single, you can see how they interact with each other. Um, So have a look. You would tend to find that Males of the species will very often try and emphasize uh, things that they have. And that could be anything. You know, it depends on the situation. It could be creativity. It could be intelligence. It could be money, you know, through buying drinks or wearing nice clothes. It could be um, strength, you know, physical strength through wearing tightly fitted clothes that accentuate muscles and that kind of thing. Um, and Equally, you tend to find that females of the species will do their best to emphasize youthfulness. Um, Now, again, I'm not saying that everybody does this, but it is a definite trend in human behavior, particularly when trying to attract a mate. So just go out, have a little look, and you'll see what I mean. Okay, it's time for some evaluations. So I've got three studies for you to evaluate. Um, So first off, we have research support for female choosiness. So Clark and Hatfield in 1989, they took female and male students on a university campus and they were tasked with walking around and approaching members of the opposite sex and engaging them in conversation and then to finish that conversation with a very simple question that is will you go to bed with me tonight now it's a bit of a stuffy question but essentially they're asking them to have sex and the responses were very very telling 75 percent of male students agreed however not one single female said yes. So the research supports the idea that females are choosier than males when it comes to selecting sexual partners, um, and that actually males and females have developed different reproductive strategies to ensure reproductive success. So you've actually got support for both strategies there. Moving on, you've got this idea that actually mate choice might be a little bit more complicated than suggested by this approach, because the approach suggests that um, it's all about certain characteristics and that those characteristics don't really change. However, Penton-Voke in 1999 suggests that female mate preference actually changes um, across the menstrual cycle. So they found that Females prefer a partner with very, very strongly expressed masculine features when they're most fertile. But actually, they preferred partners with slightly feminized features um, as a long-term mate. So that suggests that because masculine appearances suggest a much healthier immune system, um, which could be advantageous to pass on to offspring, And slightly feminine features suggest kindness and parental cooperation, which is quite a desirable trait in a long-term partner. So to break it down, the research suggests that when the female is ready to reproduce, they want a very masculine member of the opposite sex for the best genes. And then when it's time to raise the child and have a long-term partner, they prefer somebody who is slightly more feminine because then they're more likely to be kind and caring um, and be a good parent. 
So findings like that suggest that actually there's probably a range of factors that play a role in mate choice, and it's not just about indicators of genetic fitness. And then one final bit of research support. You've got research conducted by Buss in 1989. Um, he did research in 33 different countries using over 10,000 adults and asked questions relating to age and attributes um, that the theory predicts should be important for partner preference. And he found that women place a, place a greater value on resource-related characteristics such as good financial prospects, ambition, industriousness, um, etc., whereas males valued reproductive capacity in terms of good looks, uh, youthfulness, chastity, etc. So these findings reflect that sex differences in mate strategy are there. They also support predictions about partner preference, which come from sexual selection theory. Interestingly as well, these findings can be applied across vastly different cultures. So they reflect fundamental human preferences that are not dependent on cultural influences, but are due to evolution. So for once, we have some research that proves that it is actually universal, or quite universal, and not just culturally specific. Okay, so I hope that has all made sense. Remember, when you're evaluating, studies are the most powerful type of evaluation. I've given you three studies there. If you don't like my evaluation points, that's absolutely fine. I'm sure that there are other ones that you can get from your book that you're using. Um, I just thought that those are three nice ones. Okay, so I hope that's been useful. I hope it's all made sense. And thank you very much for listening.